Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, one and all. Thank you so much for uh, coming to this uh, showing. We thank you also for staying with us. In this film, we've seen an extreme picture of uh, how digital technologies can be used for oppression and social control. We also know uh, how heavy the trend is uh, where digital technologies threaten human rights, especially through surveillance. That's precisely what we're going to talk about this evening, and uh, more globally, we're going to talk about uh, AI and what we can do with it, what can be done with the risks, and uh, how we can face them. We are going to have with us uh, Peggy Hicks, who is um, director of uh, the thematic engagement division, thematic engagement, special procedures and right to development at uh, the OHCHR. She has also worked for Humans, Human Rights Watch as a Global Advocacy Director and also represented the UN mission in Kosovo. We also have Olivier Allais, who is a Program Coordinator at the ITU. You've also worked for the French Development Agency on uh, digital projects in French-speaking Africa, uh, in Burkina Faso and Mali, more specifically. And uh, remotely, we have uh, Susie Allegri. She is a um, human rights lawyer who's worked for Amnesty International and the EU. She's also a published author. She has published in 2022, Freedom to Think. And in May, uh, her forthcoming book will be published. It's uh, entitled Human Rights Robots Wrong, Being Human in the Age of AI. So first question, as I was saying, We've um, seen an extreme version of an oppressive use of technologies. I remember 15 years ago uh, during uh, the time of Arab Springs, we tended to be optimistic. We talked about uh, uh, the um, possibility of emancipation coming with the new technology. Peggy Hicks, do you think we've been blind to these risks? inherent to new technologies and uh, is there a new awareness of this these days? Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you all tonight on this important topic. Uh, I do think uh, I was at Human Rights Watch during the Arab Spring and I remember uh, that idea that we had that there was the ability to, to get information, to understand what was happening. We do so much monitoring of human rights reporting, and suddenly we were able to know real time what was happening in a dramatic situation. Uh, and, uh, and it was a moment where we really thought technology was, was going to save us. Um, and now there is a sense that technology may destroy us at times. And, and I guess my basic message is that um, we are probably overly optimistic then and we can sometimes be overly pessimistic now. In my job, we still see how technology can, can really do a lot in terms of helping us on the human rights side to know what's happening and for people's voices to be heard. Uh, but at the same time, as we've seen in this film, and as I'm sure we'll talk about tonight, there are enormous risks, and we're doing way, way too little to respond to them. Um, Susie, uh, même, même question. Est-ce qu'on est passé du... Susie, same question. We, maybe we idealize technologies, no? Today, conversely, we... we keep talking about a tech backlash or uh, some form of despair. Human rights activists have uh, had this hope and now they feel that doors are closing to them. Go through waves. I mean, one of the things that I looked at in my book was actually looking at sort of the aftermath of um, the Second World War and Nazi Germany that sort of gave us the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And I think it's very interesting when you look particularly at the speech given by Albert Speer, who was one of Hitler's, he was Hitler's uh, minister for armaments at his trial in Nuremberg, that he said then that the danger of being terrorized by technocracy 
threatens every country in the world. And that was in the 1940s. Um, I think, again, if you look at sort of the work of George Orwell in 1984, that vision of technology and the way that technology could be misused was something that in the middle of the 20th century was very obvious and very clear. And I think for me, um, you know, working post 9-11 in the human rights movement, I saw technology as well as a risk, as a tool that could be used potentially for good, but also particularly with increased surveillance, you know, the Snowden files, all of those kind of things. I think it slightly depended on who you spoke to. But then I also remember the first time I got an iPhone, it didn't occur to me that my iPhone could be watching me, that I could be tracked with my iPhone, something which today seems very obvious. So I think we are getting now a bit of a moment of reflection to see that the tech that we all use, the tech that is being provided by the, the private sector, consumer technology, can potentially be harnessed in ways that will have really serious impacts on our societies, on our democracy and on our human rights. Euh, Olivier Alley, on, on a entendu beaucoup de, de mots et d'expressions ces dernières. Olivier Alley, these past um, month and years, we've uh, discovered new expressions like big data or algorithms. That's a word that uh, uh, IT specialists have been using for years, of course. But now we're talking about uh, um, artificial intelligence and gen generative artificial intelligence. So when we're talking about AI, what do we actually talk about? And how is it a breakthrough compared to what we knew before? We've uh, experienced turn points with the internet, for example, but we are at um, a new turning point, right? Well, absolutely, and it started in 2017 exactly. So to answer your question, what is AI? AI is an algorithm. So what is an algorithm? That's also a question worth asking. You know, a recipe is an algorithm. When I make pancakes and when I mix a flour and milk, and then when I put it in my pan, that's I follow an algorithm. That's an open algorithm. I just described it. It is an open algorithm. And if you want to replace my wheat flour by rye flour, are you free to do so? So it's an open algorithm. But every time you uh, make your pancakes, it's the same thing. You follow the algorithm and you insert data, uh, flour, milk. You can change the quantities, you can change the input. But m moving on to the big data world, well, they are algorithms, I same as the recipe I described. There were or they were written and they could analyze data. So that's something that we've done. We did it on uh, the um, ancestor of AI, the Eastern expert. Those were conventional algorithms that were used to analyze data, a lot of data. We used them, we, we thought of using them to replace um, doctors. That's something that we were thinking about 15, 20 years ago. The idea was to ask uh, loads of questions to doctors and insert those questions and those answers in databases, and we thought that could replace doctors, but no, it didn't work, uh, apart from very basic questions. I mentioned 2017 earlier. What happened in 2017? Well, that's when uh, we um, first had self-generative algorithms. So that was the breakthrough. And today, we have algorithms that we can't really read. We can read them, but IT engineers do not program them. They fine-tune them. So IT engineers these days test artificial intelligence, and it's through feedback loops. In some cases, it can be very, very positive. The ITU, for example, we have working groups on AI and uh, natural disasters. So for us, you know, we can analyze um, satellite imagery to see if uh, there are disasters um, coming. 
the same thing for healthcare. We can analyse uh, medical pictures and see if um, there are cancer cells on them. But now with the generative AI, there are new things emerging. We can produce photos and videos, and it's hard to tell if they've been taken or made by humans or by an artificial intelligence. So we're thinking about inserting watermarks in the picture or in the video that can certify that it was generated by an AI. But today we're we're not quite there yet. You know, I could just, for example, uh, create a video through ChatGPT and then do a screen capture of the video, and that removes the watermark. So I won't be able to tell that the video, the photo, was generated by AI. For example, on ChatGPT, we are looking at implementing some policies, but on the dark web, we will find AIs without any policies. So if you want to generate the video of a politician, for example, you'll be able to do that. So that's what AI is. They're good things, they're bad things. Susie Allegri, in your next book, you're giving many examples of this. It seems that um, the discussion is uh, very polarized. So you have uh, the techno-optimists for whom AI is going to solve humanity's main issues. And there's, there's the other side of the coin, the very pessimists who um, claim that AI is a threat to humanity. We can feel the first effects of AI in the military, in the justice system. There are already some impacts of AI. Could you give us a few examples of uh, AI in our lives today? I think what I found when I started to look at, at AI in detail was that you know these existential threats for me are not really what we need to be worrying about. What we need to be worrying about is how AI is being used today. And I mean, you know, this year in many countries around the world, including where I am here in London, we are going to be facing elections with unregulated access um, to generative AI in particular and the ability to create deep fakes and to create um, propaganda on a scale that we haven't seen before in democratic elections. And that, I think, is something which we need to get hold of very fast. We're given the impression that it's all too big and too difficult and too international and we can't actually deal with it. But if you think about the way laws work, if you look at you know the criminal law, you know, murder is illegal. That doesn't mean that nobody ever kills anybody else. But the fact that murder is illegal, there are consequences and that we have in place systems um, in many countries, for example, um, limitations on arms sales, means that we minimize those risks. And that is something that we could be already doing in relation to AI. And if you look at it in relation to democracy, I think it's going to be interesting to see how different countries' rules around elections grapple with that question and what the consequences are for violating um, election rules. But what I saw, and I think what maybe concerned me the most about the way AI is developing, and it's something you don't see very much, I suppose, unless you're involved in it, is the pushing, if you like, of AI chatbots as companions, as friends, as therapists, as partners, as basically alternatives to human engagement and human interaction. And I think that, for me, was something that was really concerning. And well, what is that going to do for our ability as humans to engage with each other, to support each other, uh, to have empathy? And in those kind of areas, I mean, particularly um, the sale of or the um, advertising of chatbots as alternatives to human relationships or as alternatives to professional therapy, I think there is scope to have quite clear regulation. Um, in countries uh, dealing with that, limiting how it's used. Because, uh, you know, as I said earlier about establishing laws, it doesn't necessarily stop bad actors from acting badly. But most people don't want to break the law. Most people will try to act uh, within the law. And I think we shouldn't be distracted by existential doom 
or the fact that, well, somebody might break the laws if we if we make them. We need to focus on getting regulation in specific areas and making sure that it's enforceable, that we have access to justice and can make sure that our laws uh, work in practice. Alors on va évidemment longuement parler en de, de Of course we'll be discussing uh, rules and regulations uh, at length but before that Peggy Hicks uh, we spoke a while ago about uh, threats uh, to freedoms uh, uh, posed by uh, these new technologies they're far from being new there's been uh, the development of uh, surveillance technologies uh, what does AI change to this is it uh, a new threat a bigger threat uh, to uh, human rights? There are uh, numerous threats, and I, I, I second what uh, Susie says about the fact that um, we tend to focus on sort of the, the existential issues and, and forget about the things that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So AI allows a lot of bad things to be done much more quickly and at scale, we say, that much more widespread. Um, so some of the, the police activities that you might see in a, in a limited way are now supercharged by the ability to gather information, as we saw in the film. Um, but one of the examples of this is the use of facial recognition. Facial recognition has been rolled out through law enforcement agencies throughout the world um, based on uh, technology that allows uh, large databases to be scanned and for people to be identified as potentially criminal. The problem is there's no regulation on that technology. And so how reliable it is, is it 80% reliable? So 20% of the people identified may not actually be criminals or even suspected of any crimes. And there are, all, are cases of the technology being misidentifying people and people suffering you know, really severe consequences because of it. Technology like that's being used, for example, in predictive policing systems where they're um, deployed in areas to try to identify areas that are at higher risk for crime or in uh, sentencing algorithms being used on, in terms of determining how long somebody will need to go to prison. So all of that is built around the idea that uh, we can use an algorithm or, or AI to help us do things at scale and with more data behind it. The problem is those data sets that they're using have been shown themselves to build in all sorts of levels of discrimination. Um, and that's true both of, of traditional AI and the generative AI, which is the, the big issue today. Alors, effectivement, Olivier Allais, uh, c est, c est... Olivier Allais. The idea, the notion of uh, biases in uh, databases, that's a major challenge uh, given uh, AI, and it's very hard to audit at this stage, isn't it? Well, we end up with systems that are hard to audit, and we're learning by doing, essentially. Uh, that's uh, the crux of the matter. We don't really have uh, specific standards that help us identify these biases. And then there's what we try to do at the IDU at the moment. We're trying to integrate and mainstream human rights in all of this. Uh, the ITU is an agency, a standard-setting agency. Uh, we've got uh, different groups who discuss uh, uh, fiber optics, uh, future internet networks, uh, but all of this uh, integrates uh, AI. AI is everywhere at this stage. So it's something that we discuss at length in our offices. And at this stage, we're trying to mainstream human rights and integrate human rights into this technology. To give you an example, what does uh, freedom of expression mean uh, from a technical point of view? What does uh, privacy mean from a technical point of view? And that's the work that we try to do. We try to integrate uh, human rights into our standards uh, so as to protect individuals. Susie Allegre, a while ago you said 
that we shouldn't be impressed by this notion of existential threat, that there were a lot of things that could already been, be done at this stage. There are a lot of discussions in many countries, in many bodies uh, around AI at the United Nations, at the European Union, at state level to try and set standards, rules, laws and legislation. What are the tools that we have ready, that we have at our disposal, and what is missing, in a sense? What should be done today if we want to face uh, these issues? I think one of the big problems in the discussions around AI and technology more broadly is that there can be a tendency to say, we've got to regulate AI. Well, what does that even mean, actually? I think when you actually focus on what AI is being used for in certain sectors, it's much easier to understand how regulation would work and the tools that we already have, the legal tools uh, that we already have. So if you look, for example, at using generative AI in legal submissions, and we've seen cases from the US that have sort of made the media with lawyers making themselves look very stupid by using ChatGPT to make legal submissions, which then invent um, case law. Well, it would be relatively easy for bar associations to regulate the ways that lawyers are allowed to use generative AI or not, and to make it very clear what will not be permitted, for example, in court proceedings in terms of the use of generative AI. And that could be done you know, on a local, national, regional level. It doesn't require a whole new suite of regulation around AI, and you'll find that in relation to lots of different areas, that we don't have to fix all of AI. AI is ultimately a tool. And so I think, you know, the human rights laws that we have and understanding what they really mean in terms of the way technology is being used and the capacities uh, for technology. And in my previous book, um, I focused on the right to freedom of thought and this idea that big data gives some kind of insight into what people are thinking or can be used to manipulate how people think and how they behave. Well, in my view, I think we can use the rights that we already have, things like the right to freedom of thought in interpreting existing legislation like in Europe, uh, the general data protection regulation to make sure that it works and that it is effective to deal with the, th the new threats that are coming through. So I don't think we need to be over obsessed with the idea that we need a global uh, regulation that deals with everything that AI can possibly throw up and that everybody has to have the same standard. I think we can begin right now to use the human rights that we have uh, to interpret and apply the laws that we have and that what we really need is access to justice and enforcement. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez, Peggy? Peggy, what do you think about that? And in this context, what is the, the role of major international organizations and bodies? Uh, what do you think of uh, what Susie has explained? Uh, she explained that uh, we could take things uh, sector by sector, area by area. And in this context, what is the role of major international organizations? Sorry about that. Um, no, I totally agree with with Susie that that we the the sectoral approach is what we need, and we should start with the areas that are are most human rights facing. I talked about use of of artificial intelligence in law enforcement and the judicial system. Obviously, areas where people's human rights are very much at stake. So we can do it in the way that Susie described and looked at it. And part of what we do in international organizations is try to both advise and work with, with governments that are trying to do that. Um, but also one of the projects we have in my office, the UN Human Rights Office, is to try to look at the, the role of business in the sector. Um, there is a set of standards called the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights that basically say that companies themselves have to understand human rights and make sure that they look at their products not just when they're being rolled out, but throughout the design and the development of their products to, to figure out you know, before I put this on the market, what might it do? Now, if you think of something like, you know, 
drug companies and, and pharmacies, of course we expect those types of products to undergo some rigorous testing and thought before they go out. Well, the same thing needs to happen, obviously, with, with new technologies. There needs to be um, really serious thought given to the potential good and bad uses of technology, and companies need to figure out um, how to control or mitigate the risks that the, those technologies face. So we work with companies to try to push them to do much more of that human rights due diligence. And we also talk to governments about potentially regulating those companies and making sure that some of that uh, human rights due diligence is done in a mandatory way as well in case not every company wants to do it voluntarily. Olivier Allais, quel est le rôle d'un organisme comme l'UIT dans ce débat Olivier Allais, what can the ITU do in uh, such a conversation because uh, we know that you are talking about these issues at the ITU, we know that there is work being done on other in other institutions that uh, focus on internet standards and how do you uh, um, find a way to work with civil society as well and how do states discuss these topics together also with the private sector well the ITU is a platform and it's quite unique in the UN system and we have members who are member states and members who are private companies so they regularly come to Geneva and they work in you know, different working groups and they try to find common grounds on uh, the, the upcoming norms for upcoming standards, like for example, 6G or um, metaverse, AI. They can talk about future fiber optics that uh, will um, build on existing AI. So we do talk about these issues at the ITU. Now, it's difficult just to find consensus because you can very, very well imagine that 193 states plus uh, private companies plus uh, uh, academics, it can be difficult to agree on anything at times. And if you inject human rights in the mix, well, it doesn't make everyone happy. But to give you an idea, the ITU is just starting to talk about human rights about 10 months ago uh, used um, the term human-centric technology and then we started talking about digital rights but little by little we started thinking you know uh, we have to go for it and it was difficult to dare you know because we have member states in front of us and that's talking about human rights uh, that's that's quite heavy in the UN system because that means that there are laws behind there are binding texts that will have to be applied so we opened Pandora's box at the ITU with that in the various working groups. And we are realizing little by little that, yes, there can be some issues, frictions, especially on privacy. We have a working group that is dedicated to normalizing cybersecurity. And some member states are not so keen on human rights because they want information. I'm not going to say that they're, they're spying on their population, but they want to have information on what is going on with the population. Just imagine if there's a bomb going off in Geneva tomorrow, governments will want to know what happened. That's the argument. But if we put too much human rights in technology, it can also uh, protect evildoers. So we have to find the right balance. You know, here we're talking about Geneva, but I've uh, worked abroad for many years. And when you're in a totalitarian state, as we've seen in a film, well, you can track uh, journalists, uh, human rights activists, and that's something that can be done thanks to technology. And it's also because of the fact that technology does not embed enough human rights elements. So it's a multifaceted discussion.
But that's exactly the discussion that uh, we are having at the ITU at the moment. That's why we need uh, Peggy's support at the OHCHR to embed human rights. That's very important for us. You know, I'm an engineer. You know, 90% of my colleagues are engineers. They don't understand human rights sometimes. Uh, they don't know much about them. So what does it mean, freedom of speech in the context of technology? What does it mean having access to information? What does it mean concretely? How do you translate? translate that concretely in technology. And that's exactly what we're talking about, because there's no text today that establishes a direct link between a human right and its concrete application in technology. And this is something that we are realizing more and more. You know, for example, we have a working group on fiber optics, fiber optics, that's access and accessibility. It's the fact that, you know, I can speak my language on the internet, if I'm in Western Africa and I want to speak Bambara online, well, that's that's a right, you know, and we need to translate that right technically. So we are currently translating these concepts into technology, and it's not something that only the ITU is working on, you know, I just gave you the example of language. When you want to um, uh, encode a uh, new language, this is not going to be done by the ITU, it's done by Unicode, and it's the IETF focusing on, on, uh, on that encoding languages. So when you want to type Bambara in your URL and your um, uh, browser, then it's another institution, it's ICANN. So embedding human rights and technology is not just the ITU, it's many, many organizations, technical organizations and not so technical organizations that need to work together. So ICANN, if I'm not mistaken, and they, it's the organization that uh, um, manages um, domain names and IETS, it's the task force that is in charge of drafting technical standards. Absolutely, the IETF also develops technical standards that focus on what is happening on the web, you know, in your browser. And the ITU is much more so in the background, the major infrastructure, the networks, and not the computer as such, but what's behind. Peggy Hicks, can we find common standards or common language, especially in terms of human rights and technology, when approaches and even interests can be very divergent, differences between countries and regions. Can we have multilateralism and AI at the same time? important question and and uh, the reality is as as uh, Olivia said uh, many of the people that work with new technologies come from an engineering or technology background and unfortunately in my office we do have a lot of lawyers and so there is there can sometimes be a little bit of difficulty communicating um, but it's one of the things we're really working on is um, we hear a lot of interest from people that work within the tech sector who want to who are concerned about the impact of the the, the work that they're doing on human rights, and they do want to understand, you know, how better to build in human rights by design within what they're doing. But the language that we all speak has to itself be translated a bit, and part, that's part of what our office tries to do is is to really talk about human rights in a way that it, it shows how universal it is. We celebrated last year the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Susie. Uh, referred to. Um, and that's 30 articles that are simple, they're very clear about what it means to be a person who lives in, in freedom and dignity. And when we talk about those rights and what they mean in today's world, that means we have to think about how they apply to digital technologies. Um, and the reason why we emphasize so much the usefulness of human rights is exactly because it is universal. It's a framework that does, isn't specific for one cultural context or one region of the world. It's a, a framework that's already been agreed and does apply across these key issues we're talking about. It applies across privacy in elections. It applies to issues of health and education. It applies to the right to freedom of expression um, and the right to be free from torture. So it goes across all of those uh, 
rights, and it gives us a foundation that we can have a conversation with China, with the U.S., and with every country in between. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, is make sure that we use that framework to really um, give substance to these conversations. Now, I agree with Susie, though. It doesn't, that doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, one law that's uh, going to, to be across everything. And if we waited for sort of the global treaty on these issues, we'd probably, you know, the technology would move much more quickly than the, the treaty process uh, can. But what we do want to say is how can we bring these human rights foundation into the work that's being done at the global level, at the regional level, at the national level level, including in smart cities projects like the, not always exactly like what we saw uh, in the film today, but the idea that, you know, this technology is being embedded in your healthcare systems, in your access to public benefits, um, in your employer's screening of um, job applications. So in all of those settings, we need to really look at how we're, how we're embedding uh, these human rights standards to make sure that discrimination and privacy and your other rights are, are are part of the process. Suzy Allegre, un peu, même question d'une certaine manière, comment vous voyez les choses? Uh, Suzy Allegre, same question. According to you, how can we find common standards on, on this issue? Of course, we understand what you said. You said that uh, you need to uh, first um, tidy up your own backyard, but what can we do in terms of international texts on this topic? I think it will probably be either in forms of guidance and sort of interpreting what human rights law means in these sort of modern uh, circumstances. So one of the things that I think would be a really useful tool is um, general comments. So the Human Rights Committee issues general comments which explain, if you like, what specific um, articles of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or specific human rights issues mean in a particular context. And I think developing the understanding of what human rights law means to these new contexts, I think, would be hugely valuable. As to a sort of global treaty, I worry that there could be just a huge amount of time spent trying to get an agreement where really we need to deal with regulation and with getting on with it. I feel like it could be uh, a distraction. But I think that that's not to say that the international efforts that are ongoing in many for in the UN, um, but also in the OECD, the Council of Europe, the European Union, you know, there's really interesting and um, informative work that's going into thinking, how can we protect human rights in these contexts, in particular arenas? And I think that is incredibly useful work. But I think we don't need to get hung up on having a global treaty. What I think is more important right now is actually establishing, and that's probably going to be on a country or potentially um, in the case of the European Union, it could be on a regional level, establishing liability for companies. Because I think that when liability is made clear, when they find that they are facing really serious civil or even criminal sanctions for the outcomes of things that they may have created, that they may have put on the market without um, taking proper precautions, that that will go a long way to focusing minds on how to think about safety, how to think about human rights before you put things on the market. At the moment, if it, you know, it's very difficult to create effective access to justice, to challenge big multinational corporations. I think if we are able to do that, which could be on a domestic level, I think that will start to shift the understanding that actually, okay, these are laws, there are risks, we need to take account of them because there will be consequences. And I think that's, you know, that is an area that needs to be looked at as well as looking at global ideas and global guidance on how human rights um, operates in this new environment. Alors effectivement, je voulais y revenir à cette question de la. Uh, wanted to um, come back to that um, accountability for companies. How do we go about it? Because if we want to um, impl to, to apply um, GDPR. We're faced with lawyers, armies of lawyers who are trying to find loopholes. So. 
even if uh, you have the right legal tools, it's not easy. How do we manage Peggy Hicks to make sure that companies are held accountable? Not an easy question to answer for all the reasons that, that you and Susie have said, but there's a lot more that can and, and needs to be done. Um, but part of what we have to recognize as well is that the technology, while we talk a lot about the big companies and they are a big part of the issue, um, there are multiple layers of different types of companies, different types of tech companies doing, you know, there's the social media side, there's the surveillance technology companies, you know, and everything in between. Um, and, you know, there are also companies uh, scattered throughout the world doing uh, different things with with uh, this type of technology, with, with at times, even less commitment to some of these uh, principles than, than what we see. So what we're trying to look at is, is multiple layers. Um, we, we do work with the companies themselves. Um, we do think actually this tech backlash is meaningful, that there is consumer pressure for companies to do better. Um, that's part of why you hear the companies, even though they don't necessarily always follow up on it, saying that they want more regulation. Part of it is there isn't, you have to create incentives for companies to want to do the right thing. It, it can be, you know, more time consuming, more costly for them to build in some of the safety features. Um, but it's better if there's an incentive for them to do that so that they are not, you know, competed out uh, because of the things that they're doing. So we need to make sure that we're creating those incentives through through legislation as well, and then that will push companies to do better. Um, at the same time, we're also pushing within industry for so-called co-regulation so that the companies uh, and others within an industry like social media, you know how each social media company has its own rules about which speech they're going to allow up and which they're going to take down, but there could be minimum standards that could be enforceable and for which companies could be held accountable on that front as well. And then, of course, um, the companies themselves, uh, we try to create a race to the top by reporting on which companies are doing better and which are, are doing worse. And hopefully that will allow consumers and others to, to be able to put more pressure on and their own employees. You've seen even within some of the, the tech companies, you've got people who want to be associated with a company that's, that's doing good, not doing evil. So those are some of the levers that we have. Olivier Allais, technical standards are also a means of uh, pressuring things, especially uh, private sector entities. Yes, it is. The ITU drafts uh, technical recommendations. Uh, recommendation is a non-binding document. But if member states find a consensus, they tend to implement it. What we try to do at this stage, and I'm crossing my fingers, that uh, in the short term, technical recommendations published by the ITU will uh, include human rights considerations. So we try to train the engineers who draft them uh, to tell them how important human rights are. And when they draft their recommendations, they should write a paragraph or two or even maybe a page, if uh, possible at all, on human rights to explain how the technology that they're designing will impact human rights. If we get to this stage, I'd be extremely pleased. And then we've got uh, ITU projects so that these recommendations be implemented at national level. If it's at international level that they're implemented, uh, it stays in limbo. We need these recommendations to be implemented at national level. And we've got projects that push member states and support them so that they take a, a recommendation partially or in full and implement it. I uh, work for the standard setting uh, office, but we also have uh, uh, an office in charge of uh, radio telecommunication. These uh, give rise to treaties, which are binding instruments. Uh, there are treaties that say, well, if a plane takes off in Geneva, the frequency to speak uh, to air traffic controller is uh, such and such. And because uh, you cross the border with France, this frequency cannot change. It would be a safety issue. So whenever there is a safety matter, it's a treaty. If not, it's a recommendation. 
So this is uh, the means of pressure that we have. We'll shortly move to questions from the floor, but I do have one last question to each single one of you, and I'll ask you for a brief answer. What about uh, uh, AI? Uh, can they be respectful of human rights, Susie? I think they are, uh, but I think that what we really need to understand is that actually there are some, we don't need AI for everything. It's not necessarily about technical solutions, it's about societal choices. So I think it is possible, but I think it's only possible if we accept that technology does not solve everything and that we don't need a technological solution to every single part of our lives. Peggy? No, I Peggy? Said as well, um, I mean, we often uh, talk about the fact that what we see in the online world, you can't solve a problem on social media. You can't eliminate discrimination on social media because we live in a world in which discrimination is rampant. So we have to make sure that when we're looking at what the problems are with AI, we're not just looking at the particular technology, but the people behind it and the incentives behind it and the accountability and transparency around the making of it. That to me is, is key. And I agree, it's the accountability side that Susie's talked about, but also that transparency side. Part of the problem that we, we have in addressing some of these issues is, is that there just isn't enough information available and there isn't enough access to that information. And that's one of the things that will really help us uh, do better here. Olivier? Olivier? Yes, I do think it's possible. And I think it will be possible when we've managed to translate human rights uh, in technical terms. Uh, that's uh, of paramount importance. At this stage, we speak too much about ethics Ethics is great, but we it's something that's rather vaguely, loosely defined. So we need to translate human rights. We know exactly what we mean by that. And we need to translate them in technical terms, in technical standards. That's of paramount importance. If we manage to do that, we'll have managed to uh, mainstream human rights in technology right from the start. Thanks to the three of you. I'm turning to the floor to see whether there are questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I see a couple of hands raised here and there. Good evening, Ilan Acher, Amnesty International Switzerland. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists and to the FIFDH uh, for having organized this event. I'd like to make a comment to bring back the debate to Geneva and Switzerland uh, to tell you that uh, Amnesty International, together with the Digital Society and Algorithm Watch, has launched a campaign called Stop Facial Recognition. Obviously, at this stage uh, in Switzerland, we don't experience what we saw in the movie. Uh, in China, but these technologies are being rolled out in Switzerland. There have already been positive results. The Basel Canton, uh, St. Gallen has banned mass, mass surveillance and mass recognition in crowds, which is a great success. So please uh, go and check out our website. There is a wealth of information that explains uh, what uh, Swiss law uh, permits, and we would like there to be a global ban, even in Geneva, where it was uh, discussed at uh, local council level last week. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I do have another one. It's uh, what about uh, banning uh, technologies uh, if they're negative for human rights? Is that part of the tools that exist? We do a call in our in our organization for a moratorium on the use of, of certain technologies until there are sufficient human rights guardrails around. And surveillance technology, um, such as like the Pegasus software, which you may have heard of, that can turn your phone in, into a weapon, basically. Um, you know, things like that. We, we do call for moratoria on technology like that. Surveillance technology, the surveillance cameras, CCTV, um, probably doesn't cross that line, but we too, like our, our colleagues at Amnesty International, have been very clear about um, how those uh, technologies should not be used in a mass surveillance setting um, and should not be used real time, for example, uh, to monitor people going in and out of places. Oui. 
là-bas. So there are other questions. Yes, over there. Thank you so much for the film and for the debate for being here tonight. I have a question. In the film, the wife of uh, the lawyer who was detained and tortured said something very interesting. She said that they that people are complacent and that is something that make human rights violation possible. So uh, my question goes out to the three of you. Do you think that the general public will end up revolting against the use of those digital technologies? And if so, why? And if not, why? So who wants to start? Well, I think, yes, it is possible, but we need to communicate to the general public what this issue is about and what are the risks. You know, in Europe, it took us a while to understand uh, the issue between data privacy. And 10, 15 years ago, when we were talking about it, you know, what people used to say was that, well, it doesn't matter, you know, they're gathering our data, what what, what does it matter? And it took it took time for people to realize that there was an issue. And same thing with AI, I think we will reach critical mass of people who are going to be aware enough of the situation to change things. So we need events like this one to talk about that. Suzy, a word on uh, public opinion? I, I believe, and I, I think I'd feel very depressed if I didn't believe that there is the opportunity for change. And I think complacency is a big problem. And it's one of the reasons, um, really honestly, why I decided to write a book instead of, you know, like Peggy, I had a background in um, human rights organizations. I'd written plenty of reports, plenty of position papers, press releases. Um, and I think I suddenly thought, actually, what about writing a book that will be read by the general public about something that makes me feel really concerned, which was about you know, the threats to our freedom of thought? Because I felt that while privacy um, you know, has started to get some traction, it was always something where people felt like, well, I haven't got anything to hide, so it doesn't matter. Whereas people are very concerned about losing control of their minds, if you like, or the idea of having your mind read or manipulated was something that I felt was much more disturbing to the average person. So I do believe that there are opportunities and I see these issues being discussed more and more in the mainstream. And so that really makes me hope that actually people will start to push back and to make choices in their daily lives, which give that sort of consumer pushback that, that Peggy mentioned earlier, that I think ultimately we do still have some choices. Um, and, you know, in countries uh, where we have democratic elections, we do still have choices about the politicians that we vote in, and we still have a chance to defend the rule of law um, and human rights. But I think it does require everybody to understand why it matters and why it matters to them and that human rights is not just a problem on the other side of the world. It's something we all need to be concerned about. Thank you. I'm not sure there's a lot that I can add. I, I, I agree with both uh, Olivia and, and Susie on this. I think um, one thing I'd, I'd mention is that we also need to think about how these issues play out. We've talked very much, I think, focusing on sort of two different perspectives, that from the, from the film and then the perspective we're living in here in Switzerland. But we do have to think about uh, the rest of the world where there are um, an enormous digital divide, but then also when digital technologies are being rolled out, it's often in settings where um, sometimes they're being used as sort of test environments, sometimes they're being used with very limited uh, regulation, and also in settings where you don't have the same sort of judicial systems and other things in place. Um, and so these issues around what people know about what's being done with digital technologies, you know, have to expand beyond the setting that we have here to uh, a much more global conversation as well. Merci. Encore des... Oui, j'en vois une... J'ai vu une main qui se levait. Thank you. I just saw someone raise a hand. Oui, bonsoir. Good evening. I had a question. We're talking about AI, but 
there is a very strong link to data because AI is fed with data. So that uh, brings us back to the issue of uh, the fact that our entire life is being digitized. So thinking about human rights, shouldn't we look at this from the angle that we don't have the right to be monitored anymore, including by very benevolent states, of course, but as uh, everything is being regulated, states need information to apply their laws and to know whether or not their policies are efficient or not. And that takes us to a point where uh, if a citizen wants to remain techno technologically neutral, for, if I could put it that way, so they have no choice. They have to use a computer you know, to pay taxes. You have to pay taxes online. If you don't have a phone, a smartphone, you can't do anything anymore. And there is no alternative to being digitized, it will be down to the citizens to adapt. Who wants to answer? Peggy? A good point and, and something that we think about, you know, uh, issues like digital ID um, and the need for digital ID to be able to access any public services is something that we've looked at in different contexts and the impact that that can have on people who, for whatever reason, sometimes it's for reasons of disability, sometimes it's for reasons um, of, of lack of education or lack of access, um, are, are shut out because they're not part of the, the digital sphere in that way. I, I think one of, it goes back to some of these issues around transparency as well, where we need to always do that do that assessment to figure out um, if we're going to roll out a technology, what its impact will be on, on every people, and we in the UN use the phrase, leave no one behind. We have to make sure that, that you know, we did a report, for example, on the impact of digital technologies on older persons. Um, some of these are actually quite positive uh, technologies that give them access to uh, older people access to um, services that they might not have had otherwise, but obviously you can also see where some of these developments might be quite threatening to the rights of older people as well. So really looking at the issues that you're raising, I think is going to be a crucial um, issue for societies uh, in the future. Olivier? Oui, alors, de mon point de vue, en fait, ne pas être... Olivier. Well, from my point of view, not being in the cyberspace today is extremely difficult unless you live uh, as an hermit in the forest. But uh, we have looked at solutions when uh, we launched GDPR a few years back. The idea, that was exactly the idea. We wanted um, citizens to regain control over their digital lives and their data. But now things, um, you know, are a little bit different if uh, we agree on an AI act. Well, how is uh, the our GDPR applied on our daily lives? We don't have much information on this. We live in the cyber space, you know. That's that's an important term because in the U.S. in the in the U.N. we used to talk about offline and online. But when you're driving a Tesla, for example, you're neither online nor offline. You, but you're in the cyberspace. When I uh, go to the ITU and I badge in, then I'm also in the cyberspace, and we're all in it. So we have to admit it and. Uh, uh, work and find new uh, policies. Susie, do you think we can avoid digitize being becoming digitized, being digitized? And I think there are two reasons. I think firstly, we do still have the potential for choices. I remember when, when my daughter started in secondary school, the automatic thing was that they give their fingerprints in order to buy lunch. And I said, no, we're not giving the fingerprint to buy lunch. I mean, to me, that's just ridiculous. Why does a child have to give their fingerprint to use the school canteen? And actually, there is no problem. They have a card, and when they forget the card, they give their name and their class, and it gets taken out of their account. There's absolutely no reason at all 
but it's very common uh, in the UK and I think elsewhere where you know millions of school children are giving their fingerprints to get lunch. That's the reason. It, it, we don't need to do that. And if more people just say no, then actually, eventually, the tech won't be worthwhile. It won't be sold. It's about selling, essentially. That tech is being sold to schools. And if you just say no, what's the worst that could happen? You take a packed lunch. But it is very, very difficult still to avoid it. And I mean... You know, I realise walking around the streets when I go into the supermarket, I am, you know, having my face taken and run through facial recognition. It's very clear, certainly here in London, it's everywhere. But I think um, we can push back. And I think the work of the philosopher Carissa Verlis, who wrote a fantastic book called Privacy is Power, I think is really important because essentially what she says is we just don't need to be collecting all this data. It doesn't need... Uh, to be like this and collecting so much data potentially makes us vulnerable both as individuals but also societies and this um, digitization of everything what we've seen um, since last autumn in the UK is that the British Library was attacked with a ransomware attack which has resulted in effectively the, um, the, the data of everybody who's registered in the British Library being taken. I think it's potentially all available on the dark web. But on top of that, you still can't access the books. So we have buildings full of actual books dating back hundreds of years, but you can't access them because the system is down, because the system is digital. And I think we need to be prepared that if we digitize everything, we are putting ourselves also at significant risk and significant security risks. So I think that is one of the areas where it's useful to remind those that are responsible for our security and that use security often as a justification for collecting all this data and for pushing everything into the digital sphere, that actually we need a fallback position for when the lights go out. On en revient à la question de l'acceptation. Est-ce qu'on a encore le temps pour une toute dernière question Oui, on me dit oui. On va prendre une dernière question. We still got time for one last question. I see one hand raised here and there. It's hard to choose. I hope English is okay. Um, I would like to ask a bit of a provocative question. Um, we are talking a lot about uh, insecurity, about the danger of collecting too much data and being too digitalized. What can we do as citizens when there are governments agencies, who, uh, security agencies who are using our uh, data to train AI models or various softwares to get our information or influence our country's elections and so on. Data has no borders, uh, analytics has no borders. So what can we do as people, uh, even though we are concerned about uh, data, but there are others who use it against us. What can we do in that aspect so our government is prepared? because it's a bit like a catch-22. If you ask them not to prepare, not to collect data, not to be training their own models to get better to defend, they are also defenseless against others who don't follow the rules. What's your recommendation? Ah, bah, c'est toute la question, effectivement, de comment on articule les... Yes, how do... What's the right balance between protection of human rights uh, and defense? I don't know who'd like to answer this question. Uh, no, it's it's uh, your this issue around data, and, and I'm glad Susie, you know, put the the other side of the picture on in terms of, of some of the risks here as well. Um, it, it really is an enormous question in terms of the the uh, the ways in which we can. I don't think we're going to move away from from a world that has you know big data in some way. I. I Yes, there are ways we can push back on its misuse, um, but uh, and, and that is really what we focus on, is trying to figure out both, I have to admit, how we harness the power of big data to do good things, and we haven't really had much conversation about that, but there are instances of that as well, but but more looking at, as you said, you know, in an elections context, what, what are the constraints that need to be there to make sure that um, the, the worst case scenarios aren't don't play out in terms of data. But there's also, you know, you talked about training data that's being used, for example, for the generative AI large language models. You know, there 
there are lawsuits currently going on about, um, you know, whether the companies have, have um, in deploying that data and using that data, um, have violated laws. Um, and as Susie said, you know, we'll ultimately see if there's liability for some of these actions, that can also be a substantial constraint as well. Est-ce que quelqu'un veut rajouter? Non, Susie? Anyone else, Susie? It's a complicated question, and I think that one of the problems is treating it as a dichotomy that, you know, we either have to have all or nothing. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's complicated. And so it's not about saying to our governments that they can't defend us from cyber attacks, for example. But I think it's about understanding what exactly is needed, what is needed to be developed and what is needed to support those uh, developments and what those developments mean for a democratic society. So I think it's about taking a more nuanced approach and very much a legal approach, um, country by country legal approach, looking at, you know, what do we need in our particular circumstances while respecting human rights and our laws and regulations. So I think it's not all or nothing, it's nuanced. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. Thanks to the audience. Have a nice rest of evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the festival.